Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton, Kelly Barner here with you on a Dial P for Procurement edition of Supply Chain Now. Kelly, how you doing? I am doing great, Scott. How are you? Doing wonderful. Uh, we've got an outstanding live stream teed up here yes, today with one of our dear friends. Of course, uh, we should add that Dial P for Procurement is uh, presented jointly with our friends over at Buyer's Meeting Point. Uh, and Kelly, talking about the topic, the subject matter we're tackling today, a, a really a high stakes topic, right? It's very high stakes. And it's funny that you say talking because over the last few years, all anybody has done was talk about supply mm -hmm. chain. And we're about to see some serious action. So I'm glad that we have our guest with us today to help educate us on this topic and then tell us what we need to be doing to be ready. Agreed. Yeah, they certainly uh, our guest is uh, in the know, helping organizations take that action in a number of different ways across global supply chain. And he's a repeat guest, uh, one of our dear friends. So looking forward to that. We're going to introduce him in just a minute. Uh, we've got a quick announcement to make and then we're going to say hello to a few folks. Uh, but hey, folks, you're in the right, right place today for a wonderful show. Now, uh, Kelly, do you know that I think we have surpassed uh, some 1300 registrants just on LinkedIn for our 2022 Supply Chain and Procurement Awards, which, as you know, also is fueled by purpose, right? That's right. Yeah. And we'll be mentioning a little bit about this today because modern slavery, human trafficking, those are the key focus of our philanthropy partner, Hope for Justice. And we chose that partner simply because these types of issues are both important in modern business and in supply chain, and because there's something that the kinds of folks joining us today and listening on demand later can affect through their work. So huge opportunity to do good and learn. Uh, can't agree more. And you put it much more eloquently can, than I ever can. Uh, but hope for justice. That's what it's yes. all about. Their noble mission, find a way to support it. Uh, we're really excited about uh, how we're going to be able to uh, support them financially via uh, the awards while celebrating the successes across global business. So folks, you can still join. May 18th is a date of the uh, live reveal. Uh, and you can venture over to LinkedIn. There's a direct link in the comments. And of course, you can also find us at supplychainprocurementawards.com. Jointly presented between Supply Chain Now, Buyer's Meeting Point, and our friends at Art of Procurement. Okay, so Kelly, uh, let's say hello to just a couple of folks because, uh, you know, we want to make this very conversational. You know, our guest is yes. an expert. Um, it will have a lot of value he's bringing to the table uh, between him and the organization, the good things they're doing. But we want to hear from all the folks that are in the cheap seats, as it were, uh, like Chedley. Chedley is back with us and I like his enthusiasm. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's get into this. Let's dive in. Uh, Chedley, welcome back uh, via LinkedIn. And don't forget to let us know where where are you dialed in from right uh let's see here uh daniel is already tuned in and he's already asking questions daniel we'll wow. try to, <laughs> he's ready to go as well oh, daniel we'll try to circle back to this but daniel welcome to the conversation let us know where you're tuned in from via linkedin uh thomas is with us uh from boston ma kelly uh yeah, a neighbor <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, so much to get through over the next hour or so, but we can't get through it, Kelly, without our dear friend and repeat guest, the one and only. Can I, can I introduce our guest here today? Please do. Okay. The one and only Constantine Lembarakis, Senior Director of Global Product and Solutions Marketing at Risk Methods. Hey, hey, Hello. Constantine, how you doing? Hey, guys, how are you? We are doing wonderful, and we're doing now even we're even better now that you have joined us. That's and right. Kelly, Welcome back, we, great. Um, great. We it's learned a little tidbit about Constantine pre-show. So uh, he's got a slew of nicknames, but one of my favorites is uh, Dino. So if with yeah. your permission, uh, if we can use that here and, we're, and hey, you know, what is it about nicknames? They always do just this. They create smiles. Maybe that's why yeah, we use them so sure, much, but sure. um, great to have you back. Uh, so Kelly, 
uh, before we dive into a, a kind of a, a warm up topic uh, with Dino here, we've got a slew of folks that the uh, dam has burst. And so let's say hello to a few folks here. Alyssa's back. I think she's been with us on some previous live streams, tuned in from Boston as well. Uh, looks like she's part of the Thermo Fisher scientific team. Great to have you here, Alyssa, via LinkedIn. Of course, Diesel. Uh, Clay Phillips, diesel because the motor's always always running there. Uh, uh, Dino and Kelly, happy dial P day here at Supply Chain Now. Great to see you, Clay. Steve Trussell, uh, tuned in uh, from Florida via LinkedIn, Total Sourcing Solutions. Okay, Steve, great to have you here. Look forward I to your- I just recently met Steve. Steve, I'm glad you're here today. Fantastic. Man, it's, it's really a small world once you start uh, uh, peeling the layers of the onion back, right? And James, James is, is with us. Uh, part of uh, the risk methods team for also from Boston. I I'm, I'm picking up a little trend here. We've got a strong Northeastern contingent uh, on today's live stream and global as well. But uh, I think we're all ready to dive into the topic today, but where we're getting started, Kelly, I think we also found out that everybody knew maybe uh, folks are aware of this week in business history that you and I are big history nerds, right? Oh, big Self- time. Well, yeah, self-identify. Yes. Right. Whatever, whatever labels throw at us. Uh, we're big. We love studying history. Well, we found out that Dino here is also a big history nerd. So tell us, uh, Constantine, what's your favorite part, place, time, whatever? What, what's your favorite element when it comes to history? You know, I, I, I like when there's like a, a confluence or a pivotal point of, of change. I, I would probably say like the Renaissance. I think that's probably such a cool time when things kind of came back together and there's this elevation of enlightenment and ideas of science. And uh, it's just, it's just kind of a cool place. You know, if you go to places like Italy and France and you see just the evolution of that, I think it's probably one of my favorites. Not the only, I got a lot, but that's one that comes to mind to be enlightened. Right. How, how do you come up with these <laughs> classical ideas and reinvent them? So yeah. yeah, that's that's something I really enjoy is understanding that period of history. In fact, I will tell you, I actually went to the area in the Loire Valley, and you can go visit on top of this, where France, one of the kings of France, invited Da Vinci before he died to live with him in the Loire Valley. And you can actually visit the house where he oh did the inventions for the past five years of his life before he died and actually see his deathbed. And I was there for the 500th anniversary of his death in the Loire Valley. So really wow. cool. I highly recommend you guys. If you if you like that kind of stuff, you could go to France and see it. Cool stuff. Wow, Kelly, uh, the Renaissance. You know, we talk about Eureka moments around here I quite know. often. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine living through that period of time, Kelly? I know, seriously. And Da Vinci is such a fascinating character. One of my favorite things about him is that, you know, he's so famous for all of those different sort of pencil sketch drawings that he did. Every single mechanical design had a fatal flaw in the picture so that, you know, there was no security back then. If you got the picture, you had the design. And so he drew in a little flaw so that if anybody else actually followed the instructions other than him, the device wouldn't work. So he was a very clever guy in multiple ways. Wow. Mm-hmm. Had no idea. I learned something. See, we, we hang out with Kelly Barner, Dino, and you're always going to learn something <laughs> with every conversation. And and frankly, I feel the same way with you. We've had a couple of conversations with you here uh, Dial P, Supply Chain Now, and uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of value from what you bring to the table and, and, and how you do it. So with that said, we'll try not to uh, uh, nerd out on history too much over the next hour. Uh, but, you know, you can't you, you, you can learn so much and, and um, um, act so, so much more informed by looking back through the annals of history, for sure. Uh, really quick, Kelly, before I turn it over to you, as we yeah. get into the um, the topic of the day, Say hello to Jamie Crump, uh, who's, hello, can you just Jamie. see the mountains of North Georgia? I mean, I, that just comes with a nice little picture. I bet, I bet it's a gorgeous day up where she is. Um, okay. So folks, we want to hear from you throughout the conversation. So welcome everybody. No, we couldn't hit on everybody, but uh, we want to hear from your take throughout today's dis- discussion. So Kelly, with that said, where are we starting with Constantine here today? So we're actually going to start someplace very broad. So our primary topic for today is the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, super intense, 
legislation. It's taking effect on June 21st. So just a few short weeks away from now, we are going to go from soup to nuts on this law and what it means for supply chain professionals. But when Constantine and I were prepping for today, I thought he made an interesting point that ties to everything that procurement and supply chain professionals do right now. And that's this complexity of having some of these conversations and taking all the inputs from the news and the world around us, but remaining professional. So Constantine, I'm gonna tee you up there and, and let you sort of share the perspective that you had shared with me yesterday, because I think it applies to today 100%, but it also applies to so many of the other conversations that we end up having with business partners, with suppliers, uh, what are your thoughts around the best way for us as professionals to handle these topics? Yeah, I, I think this is such an important thing, Kelly. I mean, when you talk about things that are going on geopolitically that has an impact on supply chains, you know, you always there's this fine line of how we look at this maybe personally or then how we statement make statements uh, with as part of our corporations and companies. Um, it's 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 a struggle, but in at some point, where do we? we kind of draw the line and make a decision. And I think that's yeah. part of what's happening here with some of these regulations. Uh, you know, sometimes companies are caught between a rock and a hard place and saying, how am I by going, doing something, what we're going to talk about with this Uber law, what's the impact that's going to have on my business versus the yeah. ESG component, the environmental social governance component of not only being, you know, in it slapped maybe with a fine or an issue with a regulation, but then there's the, perception of reputation. So there's this, all these dynamics of how companies are going to have to think through what is their decision point. They're going to say, I'm willing to do this because this is what our business is founded on, or this is going to have a huge impact. I have to wait and see. So that, that that's part of the challenge here. And I think this, this discussion point we're going to have is front and center to that very much because we're seeing it every day in the news. And there's different aspects that relate to the Uyghur law as well as what's happening in China and, and globally. Yeah. So to get us started with, um, if you would just give us sort of the, the level set, where are we starting? Who are, is it Uyghurs or Uyghurs? I guess I've heard it both ways. What's the... no. Unfortunately, what's I'm your... not a linguist. I don't know ex the exact way to pronounce it because it might pronounce it in Chinese or another language. I think it's Uyghurs or e Uyghurs. I think it's Uyghurs. I just want to okay. make sure. But if we yeah. do pronounce it mis incorrectly, I don't want anybody to get that. Yes. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we could ask for the recommended pronunciation, but we'll go with Uyghur Uyghurs we'll, for now. We'll go with Uyghurs. So okay. who are the Uyghurs and what is the aim? of this law? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. So, I mean, if we go back, if we're going to use the history textbook, right? It's a place, it's the, the, the people themselves are a group of in a semi-autonomous semi region of China um, that are ethnically Chinese, but have a very strong cultural diversity, let's just say, of their background. Most of the Uyghurs are, are uh, Sunni Muslim. And the, the history behind it has a lot to do with the evolution and the spread of Islam, but it also has a lot to do with the silk trade routes that we talked about going way back into antiquity up through into the Middle Ages and all this where a lot of trade was going by. So these people, they developed a very unique culture and they are, are part of this Western part of China that borders places like Taj, uh, Tajikistan and, and Kyrgyzstan. So it's a very interesting melting pot of, of cultures and diversities. And the, the challenge that happened is I think partly because of in the late 90s, there was a push on some revolt that was going on in that region. There were some, you know, let's just say riots happening. Uh, there was concerns about maybe even terrorism spreading wider in China. And there's this connection. And this is where it becomes political about how do we control terrorism? And this is a spread of uh, extremism. And as a result of some of these things that have happened over time, What's been seen by Westerners, let's just say people at, and from the outside of China, is there's been this concern over labor or forced labor that's happening uh, in this autonomous region where uh, it's become a challenge for uh, certain uh, parts of this culture to express themselves. And so there's this kind of maybe clash of culture. And so from a supply chain economic perspective, this law has gotten really uh, based on the attention of people that are in politics and the business to say, look, there's a concern here where there's this uh, forced labor that's happening within this region where certain 
parts of this population are being contained. And our concern is over these wider concerns of humanitarian uh, issues with these people being forced to work in a certain way that mm-hmm. is a counter to uh, what we feel is is is, uh, is is something we want to be able to support as part mm-hmm. of our business and supply chains. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the context for this is that it's evolved and it's really come front forward, uh, particularly with people buying a lot of supplies. And we can talk mm-hmm. more about what comes out of this region and why it's so critical for supply chains, mm-hmm. for sure. Hey, really quick, Kelly, and I love that backdrop. Level setting is so important in these, in these, in in all conversations in business, uh, supply chain, and beyond. But really helpful here. So thank you for that, uh, Dino. A couple quick comments here because we got conversations within the conversations going. Uh, Richard, glad this is getting some coverage. I'm with you, uh, right? And and again, the global supply chain community is in a unique position to actually take action, right? Deeds, not words, to do something about it. Um, Daniel is asking about other than the U S any other countries planning similar legislation, Richard is Johnny on the spot. I think Canada, he says, and the Netherlands have publicly accused China of genocide. Perhaps they're planning similar legislation. Uh, excellent point there. Maybe we'll get both of y'all to respond, but finally on a lighter note, very lighter note. Hey, Eric, I see you, man. I appreciate that. Go Atlanta Braves defending the crown. Um, okay. So, Back to, um, I know we're getting into the legislation after yes. we kind of did some level setting. Kelly, where are we going next with our dear friend? So before we actually go to the next question, I'm going to jump way back and answer one of the questions that Daniel asked up front. I want to get this out front and center because it's material to everything we discussed today. One of the things that's important about this particular law is that materials coming from this province in China are assumed to be the product of forced labor unless your company can prove otherwise. So it's not about proving, you know, good mind, bad mind, like we might have in conflict minerals. Everything coming from this region is assumed to be problematic. Um, So now that being said, Constantine, which supply chains are affected? What are the typical materials, products, components that would be coming out of the Xinjiang province of China? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. And, and you start digging deeper into this. And if you're not familiar with the topic, you'd be like shocked and surprised at what what does come out of this region. So so the, I think the supply chains that are most effective are those in solar uh, and textiles, and believe it or not, tomatoes, of all things. Interesting. And they've already received a lot of scrutiny in this area. So in terms of just some of the statistics that we want to stick to, I think there's an estimate is it's the source of one fifth of the world's cotton. So if we're talking about the South, we're thinking about cotton, we're thinking about where these places are coming, you know, where it's coming from. And then 45%, I think is the statistic of polysilicon, which is a key material that's Mm -hmm. used for solar panels. So that on top of other areas, raw materials, including coal, petroleum, gold, electronics, and other things that companies are involved in these supply chains could face uh, and I think there's even been some uh, activism around allegations of forced labor that have been linked to Chinese manufacturers around gloves, aluminum, okay. car batteries, hot sauce, of all things. So, I mean, oh this gosh. is it, there's just so many elements here of, again, understanding and having the transparency to what you just said, Kelly, of assumed to be. Yes. And that's that's the question, right? How do you know? How do yeah. you put some proof to that? And that's that's the challenge here that we face. And it further shows how interconnected supply chain is with, with everything. So if you work in a company, and it sounds like given that range of things you mentioned, Constantine, this is not just one industry. This is a lot of different industries with materials and components at, at different layers of production. This might be something that would both come under supply chain and legal concerns, but could also potentially come under the umbrella of ESG or environmental, social and and governance initiatives. So Mm -hmm. does dealing with this law also create a good opportunity for supply chain team leads and professionals in a company to reach out to whoever heads up ESG in, in the company and sort of align yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, this shows a dynamic of how, you know, when you're dealing with a supply chain risk or compliance pr- program or challenge, that you have a diverse group of people that are involved in understanding what this means, right? Is it reputation control? Is it legal? Is it procurement? Is it logistics and distribution for supply chains? 
And so, yeah, this is a perfect opportunity for us to get more awareness. And I think the construct and the content for this, and a lot of this is being driven by what we're seeing. If you just look at, you know, you turn on CNBC and the conversations around ESG as a mm. context for, we are going to be investing in companies that are putting this front and center and putting that then back at the top line revenue construct then says, yes. well, we need to do a better job in deciding how we do this operationally and showing that we're actually doing something, not saying and just putting words to uh, uh, something we're pursuing for the sake of feeling good, right? It's an right. actual thing that's happening. So yeah, this is a perfect construct for that. But then the challenge I think we face with this is how do you embody that and how do you ensure that these things are happening? And sometimes it's coming from legislation like we just yeah. saw with this law. And that's forcing us to rethink what our supply chains are and how we, how we, how we build those supply chains. And the stakes are clear. So we know right. Customs is going to be the group that will be enforcing the law. And as with so many things, there's a whole range of potential consequences. Um, but just to maybe give people a sense of what the stakes are here, what are yeah. the different types and forms of consequences and downsides yeah. that will yeah. result from companies running afoul of this new requirement? Well, let's just kind of reiterate what we started from. It said that the law was signed in December by Biden. It's set to go in effect in June. It bans all goods made in the Xinjiang province, the province or with ties or certain entities of programs that are under the sanctions that transfer, I think, what they call minority workers to these job sites. Unless, as you said, importers can demonstrate to the U.S. government that its supply chain is free of forced labor. Now, that becomes kind of a fuzzy line because yeah. it remains very difficult for how stringently this law is going to be applied. And if it ends up affecting a handful of other companies or far beyond what it was intended to do. So there's a broad interpretation of the law that could cast certain scrutiny on these goods. But I think at this channel right now, it's not very clear what the ramifications are mm -hmm. aside from having these goods arriving at these U.S. ports that are going to be seized by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So it's not like there's a specific number that's going to say you're going to be yeah. fined X million per re billion revenue you are. And that's a part of the challenge that I think for companies that are trying to meet and, and, and ad adhere to the law. But because of the, you know, the, it's not really clear exactly what that outcome is going to be. I always say that you're going to know when the first person that gets slapped by it is oh, going to be yes. the one that's going to pay the penalty. And it's yeah. going to be a company and it could be a big company. Just to give you guys some perspective, some of the, you know, the challenges that have been happening here with companies like, um, like uh, Tesla, we're opening up uh, a, a, a factory manufacturing in Xinjiang province. Walmart was denying back, I think in January about having de deliberately moving sourced goods with the textiles. And so, you know, this is kind of this flux. And until that big company or whatever entity gets slapped, we're not really going to know. And they're going to be made an example of that. Everyone's going to pull back and say, OK, now this is on my radar. Yeah. Now, what do I do? So we, we've got, uh, as we expected, this is conjuring <laughs> up some thoughts from the skyboxes here. I want to share a yes, couple here. For sure. For um, sure. First off. Peter Bolay, all night and all day. Welcome back. Welcome in. Love to hear your take here. Yes, you have missed your Dial P installments. Glad you're and back. We've though. missed you back, Peter. Thank you for <laughs> right. being with us. <laughs> um, Eric, uh, fellow Atlanta Braves fan, he said he posted on this, this topic a few weeks ago. He says technology companies like Google and Dell are supporting the Chinese Communist Party's ability to oppress not only Uyghurs, but their society. Uh, and he puts a link to his other thoughts there. So Eric, thanks for weighing in a lot of things going on for sure. Uh, Thomas Dent says ESG needs to be contested when you have defense contractors toting ESG narratives. I have some questions. It's good to have questions. Interesting, bring, Thomas. Yeah. Bring the, the, you know, the best conversations had the toughest questions. So uh, great point there, Thomas, Steve, says the trick long-term is to build in pace planning in your category management to help with risk assessment and mitigation. Regardless of the issue, if you continually are asking yourself what would happen if you'll be assessing and preparing for those risks. Well said there, Steve. Okay, so Kelly, there, it really, um, as you can tell, there's a lot of thoughts 
Yes. Uh, but but you know one of the cool things just to weigh in it it is um, you know guilty or assumed guilty until yes. you can prove your innocence. It's an interesting take, an interesting interesting application. Uh, I applaud the government here, the federal government, in taking that action as a starting point. And I think I think what Dino and both of y'all said, there will undoubtedly need to be some tweaks, right? Yes. Um, uh, but the conversations and the questions based on what the the the, the how heavy and how um, dire the allegations have been, you know, it's good it's good for to see action taking place rather than a lot of political rhetoric yeah. rhetoric, right? Well, and there's the court of law, and then there's the secondary court of public opinion. And so I would imagine to your point, Constantine, the very first company that ends up being made an example of because of this law is certainly going to face a lot of scrutiny, um, potentially fines, potentially loss of certain kinds of status. You don't want to end up on a watch list, right? But mm -hmm. depending on the kind of company it is, especially if you are first or second tier consumer facing the public backlash from shareholders, from consumers, from brand partners, it could be even more substantial than what you're necessarily facing legally. I would think that kind of thing, that sort of brand reputational risk is a concern mm -hmm. with a lot of different supply chain issues, not just this one particular law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, again, you got great brands like Tesla and Walmart. Everybody knows yeah. these companies. There's other big companies that are doing business there. And and so I'm sure it's front and center uh, on their attention because they have the right and need to be able to properly manage their business and, and focus on that and be able to look at, you know, these challenges that they're facing. But then, you know, this legislation is trying to put some kind of enforcement in how they do business. And the, the outcome is going to be how do you best build relationships for improving the transparency of your supply chain? So, you know, as a person in that process to say, we know what's going on with our business. We know who our suppliers are. And this is where it further values the requirement or need to say, well, who am I doing business with and how am I doing business with them? And who, who, who should I know more about or what kind of assessment should I be doing on a due diligence basis to make sure we have this transparency so we know how we can manage that and manage maybe a potential backlash, may, which may be unfounded, right? There might be some unfounded aspect to this because you're associating something that may not be true, but then that's that kind of, again, realm of public opinion yeah. that could take information and, and, and may not be accurate, or it might be something that is not, has not been delivered properly. So those are, again, the challenges here that how do you better improve what you need to do and manage as a business? Yeah. For, for managing for manage something like this that is is going to be become even more important uh, as time evolves here. Now, how common is it with a law like this to require companies to prove compliance? In most cases, I think of it as being if you get caught doing the wrong thing and we can prove you did the wrong thing, then there's penalties. But this one is completely the opposite. You, as we've said, Scott, you know, you're assumed guilty until proven innocent. That's sort of the opposite of the American way. But this law and its goal are so high stakes that we've actually flipped that. Is this a frequent thing? Is this a unique kind of law? This this law specific, it's for the for the Uyghur law. In, in some yeah. ways, it is. In some approved. ways, it in some ways it isn't. So you know, again, we're us being a, a German based company. Yeah. One of the one of the things that is coming up uh, in the requirement is this uh, supply German supply chain act, uh, and I'm going to say this in German: the Lieferketten Sorgfalts Pflichtengesetz. That's how you say it. Wow! And wow. The, Can you do that <laughs> again? Lieferketten Sorgfalts Pflichtengesetz. That's literally the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. Uh, wow! And I and and so. This law is based on, refers to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and it has other certain consequences and, and ramifications that I'm not going to go into detail, but sure. basically it, it targets based on size. And there is a uh, requirement that has the ability for companies with 3,000 or more employees. Uh, and then after 2024, for those with 1,000 or more to be registered with a specific branch office, a federal branch in Germany, and be able to comply with the human rights requirements and standards that are as part of the law, as part of the foundation. And here, there are some specific fines that they call out as part of the law. So it is much more defined. And I think this is part of a greater 
uh, requirement. I think it says in the event of a significant violation, it's 175,000 euros. The exclusion from public procurement contracts is envisioned and there's all these kinds of challenges. But I think the bigger picture here is what's happening within wider EU. So there's mm -hmm. an EU due diligence law that's coming out. There are other similar laws in other countries that are part of the EU. There's similar laws in the UK. So this is part of a grander scheme of things that's evolving. But to your question about how other similar laws, well, in one case, this is, you know, one case it's based on the US that's coming from the port of origin. In the other case, it's actually is part of the detail within your supply chain and it's being dictated by a government and that's going to give a fine based on the size of your company. So mm -hmm. there's different degrees of this, but it's, it's something that's very top of mind. And depending yeah. upon where you're doing business, uh, you might be seeing these laws as kind of common challenges where you've been trying to solve that in a similar way. So uh, I want to share a couple of quick comments, uh, a comment and a question here uh, that I think just folds right into what we're talking about. Uh, Richard says more transparency equals higher demand for sustainable and ethical practices. It's difficult though, as a large company to have transparency over all suppliers, but companies will be held accountable if a supplier, even if it's a tier four or five operates in an unethical manner. And Kelly, um, Tim Nelson with Hope for Justice has made the yes. point with us that it's not, um, while we needed to identify those bad actors uh, in, in these long you know, global supply chains, it's more about, it's not about you know, shaming, right? It's more about leaders. What are you doing about it, right? Because it, yeah. it's going to be there. What are you doing about it? And I, I love that point because it kind of goes back to the point you're, that, that uh, Constantine made on the front end. Right. It's about the actions we take, how are we remedying the situation? And then one other comment here. I'm trying to keep up a lot of stuff. Uh, Dino, I uh, told you you're backed by popular demand because you bring a tidal <laughs> wave of feedback each time. Uh, Mark says the supplier has proved a statement that they uh, do not use forced labor. Is this enough or do we require on site audits or anything else to build uh, the burden of proof that we are all that we are meeting all requirements of the act? So would y'all like to weigh in on what Mark is asking there? Yeah, I, I think the way you do that is by looking at the different pillars of information that you're getting. And that's one thing that we try to do at Risk Methods is by looking at different ways. So part of that information might be coming from media, risk media monitoring that we do 24 by 7 by 365. We pull the data in, we use our algorithms to determine what's relevant and not relevant to your supply mm. chain. Another way might be using third other kinds of data from trusted sources like a DMB or a Credit Save or an Ecovatis or an Integrity Next that comes in by way of you looking at that and saying, well, this is what this company says. You may have your own data you've collected as part of performance reviews, and then you have the actual voice of your supplier. So you want to quadri is that triangulate quadri that would be four <laughs> i guess it'd be four so you bring all that together yeah. and you say okay how can i make a decision based on this yeah and that and that to me is very powerful because you're not just getting one source but then you're forcing you're, you're looking at it based, based based on the impact of your business based on the potential reputational control mm -hmm. uh based on the impact on your your business partners if they're a second or third tier supplier you're depending upon how deep they go in your channel that would be a way I'd answer that. You need to have yeah. right as much information uh, as you can to, to, to see what you think is, is necessary to make those decisions. And I For think sure. an important piece of that is that voice of the supplier that you mm -hmm. mentioned, Constantine. And yeah. so, you know, we, we opened today by talking about some of the difficult things that procurement and supply chain professionals have to be able to do as part of our job. And one of those is having what I imagine could be awkward or uncomfortable conversations with our suppliers, because if this is truly sort of a white list founded law, then it's incumbent upon us to find out what our suppliers and their suppliers are doing to ensure that these goods and materials don't enter into their supply chain. How do we even start that conversation with supply partners? Well, I think it starts with the relationship itself. It's on how, how much that trust has been built, right? And this goes far beyond just regulation and, you know, being concerned about finding it's, do you invest in your suppliers to decide on, you know, is this the innovation factor? It's that there was a, there was a study that was done about four or five years ago that looked at specific angles of how you work with suppliers and the, the, the ultimate 
uh, result of that research found that, you know, the, the ones that had the best relationships actually had the best outcomes in terms of performance and the best outcomes in terms of price negotiation because they were willing to work with each other and set trust. And I think this is part of that, right? How well do you know them and how well? And it's easier said than done because in certain regions, that, that can be very challenging and you might not have an option. And it comes down to certain commodities. And we just read the statistic on, on the polycarbonate. I may not have a choice. And especially with what's going on now in the Ukraine, which we haven't even touched, think about the fact that you have these demands, these supply chains, there might be certain constraints of where these commodities or these core materials are coming from. You might have just have to go to that region and you have to face the potential of that issue. So that it's not an easy, it's not an easy question to answer. And yeah. uh, it's, it's something that's going to be a challenge, I think, especially in this situation where we're in right now yeah. uh, with, with supply chain challenges in general. Yeah. And you say go to that region in the sense of sourcing, right, or buying from. But if we think to bring in yet another thing we haven't talked about yet, which are the lingering effects of COVID, you also yeah. literally can't go to that region because of mm -hmm. China's zero COVID policy. My understanding yeah. is that almost nobody gets in or out. So you can't even say, listen, this is so important. I'm going to go walk the factory myself. I'm going to go walk the area myself. That's not even an option. How is the inability to get firsthand insight creating further challenges for the companies that are trying to adhere to this law? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a difficult challenge. And I think this is where getting as much information as you can around a particular area or supply chain or commodity by being able to visualize it and understand what, what news is able to come out of that region is, is a major starting point because then you get a sense and, and then being able to reach out to those suppliers, you know, this digital transformation of supply chains, uh, being able to, you know, find out as much as you can and interacting with them, not even being on site, but what kind of facilities do you have to be able to understand what they're doing and how they're doing it without being on site is even become more important and making sure that that's transparent. So I don't know if there's an easy answer for that. I think it's, it's technology can help yeah. us definitely in many ways. But, you know, being more aware uh, for our procurement and sourcing professionals uh, of some of the challenges that aren't easily solved that you're just, you're spilling out. I think mm -hmm. that's an important first part of the, the, uh, the journey here. Um, a lot of comments here. I'm going to try to pick and choose a couple. Um, it's so much good stuff. We don't have time to tackle all of it. Um, there's a lot of thoughts around, as Steve talks about, uh, my approach has always been boots on the ground of some sort to prove compliance. And my company's requirements had to exceed my toughest customer's requirements. I love that. Um, Eric clarified on what he posted some earlier. Uh, it was actually from the Victims of Communism Corporate Complicity Scorecard. That's a new one for me. I've checked that out. Um, Peter makes a great point. Blockchain can solve some of the issues. Full traceability, <laughs> cradle to grave, right? And I'm going to cover Constantine on this one. Peter, you're in lockstep. Constantine said this yesterday. So yeah, we did 100%. say this yesterday. <laughs> you guys are thinking right along the, the right lines of that. Was there anything you wanted to add to that point, Constantine, since it's well, coming back on? In some cases, the, you know, a blockchain can work when it comes to traceability of something you could put a label on. But how are you going to do that with a package, you know, with commodities? Mm -hmm. That, that's the challenge, right? That That's the hard part where things can get swapped out or redirected. I think the word that they used in an article that I read was bifurcated. So how do we know that some product wasn't relabeled and re, went rematched, then moved to a different location and imported through a different part, you know, different port or different way because it was repackaged, mm -hmm. you know? And so the blockchain can take us on so far, but how traceable is that from where, from its point of origin that that's the struggle there. So you can put a tag on something, but that might be easier for a manufactured good or yeah. something that's kind of more, you know, gone into the process. But when it's something from a raw material, I think, you know, that that's really a really a real challenge. Uh, but yeah, maybe there's going to be improvements in technology that we just don't know yet uh, yeah. from there. And I actually think your your mention of cotton earlier was an excellent example because that is such a, a raw material that so many things are done with and that so many further processes are done in so many places. Mm -hmm. and so we may talk today about first, second, third tier suppliers. You could easily be talking about seventh, eighth, ninth tier suppliers once you actually map mm -hmm. all this out. 
I have to imagine part of the complexity is figuring out, okay, this box of garments or this cloth that I've purchased from Malaysia or Thailand, figuring out, did that raw material originate in Xinjiang? Is it covered by this law? You end up with sort of like a money laundering effect, whereas things are processed again and again, to your point about the tag, being able mm -hmm. to follow these things as they move globally. This really is it. You quickly start to get a sense that this is not overwhelming, right? This, <clears throat> excuse me, is something we need to be working to solve because there are serious human ramifications for us not addressing the problem. But this is not a, where is my toilet paper? Where is my Amazon box kind of mm -hmm. a problem? This is global, long reaching and, and very complex. Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't know where where this is going to end up in in the long run. You know, again, the, the, the public opinion aspect is certainly one element that's going to continue helping us to enforce uh, these laws. But it will be interesting to see how the, the Biden administration decides to promote and push forward because of what I had mentioned before, where in some cases, it's not as exactly clear what the the how stringent this is going to be applied. Are there other elements that we're going to see here where that's going to be pushed more than others? I mean, a classic example of this is with the um, back in the day with the conflict minerals as part of the yeah. Sarbanes-Oxley. I mean, I remember going to conferences with a couple of other groups and they were talking about that, like this was going to be the thing, right? Conflict minerals, uh, gold, tungsten, tin, uh, tantalum and tin, you know, where is this mm -hmm. coming from the Congo? There was a lot of attention given to that region. And I think it's still something companies are still aware of and enforcing, but you just don't, you just don't hear about it. Right. Yeah. And so is this kind of the, I'll use a word and I use another German word, Zeitgeist. Of <laughs> that one's a little given, shorter. <laughs> <laughs> they say Zeitgeist in German, it's yeah. Zeitgeist because the Z is pronounced like it's a, but anyway, the point being that the, that's kind of gotten attention, full attention because of what's yeah. going on with China. Right. And then what's going to happen with Ukraine. That's, that's front and center. But then there's, there's other there's all these regions that also have conflicts that you have to be aware of. And I think this is why it's so important to understand your industry and what you're buying and where you're buying it from, because the, some of these things you just don't know about. We yeah. don't hear about it. It's because the media isn't covering it. Right. But it doesn't mean that it's not there. And that goes back to the gentleman's point about boots on the crowd. Yeah. You know, you know, that that's exactly right. It, is there some kind of Mensa test that folks have to pass to be part of the risk methods team. Uh, constantly, you just dropped more words and knowledge than I've, you must forget more stuff than I'll ever know. Really, man. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing. But it's all in German, in. Scott. So nobody knows what any of it means. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, 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 well, it's a but, but what you recalled about those conflict uh, minerals, I've forgotten. And you even named oh, some yeah. of the, some of the uh, elements for lack of a better word. So uh, you've got a standing invitation to come on back. You make us look, well, you make me look smarter. Kelly's, you know, Kelly uh, scored very highly on the Mensa test. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, allow, they don't give folks like me the Mensa test, but let's, let's share a couple of comments here. Peter, sure. Peter's you're on fire, man. Procurement must evaluate on value creation, customer satisfaction, and not cost savings. Uh, Jamie asked a great question. Wondering how smaller businesses will handle this. Yeah. Walmart has the resources, but small and diverse owned companies will not have the boots on ground and probably have a few less options, of course. Um, uh, and then finally, Steve says, in my experience, majority of suppliers in China have two or three company names. Mm -hmm. So that just complicates matters. I would usually address that during my strategic category management review as political risk and based on the criticality of the item or commodity. I would dual source from a less risky supplier or country. Man, there's a Kelly, uh, Dino, there's a ton of expertise in the skyboxes here today. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep that coming. Uh, any kind you want to address any of those comments, whether it's small, small business, uh, some of the things that, that uh, uh, Steve uh, suggested any, any comments there, Kelly? You know, I think the thing that I want to address actually, Scott, I think you've made kind of the point of the day that there was a time when we talked about conflict minerals all the time. That was the concern. And to Constantine's points around, yes, we have this law. We know what is required. The penalties and the details around enforcement are a lot less clear. So one of the things that many companies are dealing with on an individual basis is sort of this challenge to prove that whether it's 
ESG or supplier diversity or just plain sustainability, that it's not a box check. It's not a fluffy sort of PR initiative that there's some teeth and some meat and some real work, right? So I think we are going to find out, I would imagine, in relatively short order, if this is going to be an actively enforced law or if this is about, is this a federal box check? Is this about having something on the books in case there's a clearly egregious case of violation that it says in writing you can't do this or it spells out where the burden of proof is? I think it's going to be incredibly interesting to see just how, you know, any strategy has to be operational. Is this law operational as written? What does the interpretation look like? Once again, it, you know, maybe that's the bad news. The good news is it's yet another reminder of how exciting and high stakes and important it is to have really high skilled supply chain professionals. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I don't think in, in the big picture that this is going to go away, right? This is not just like it's a trend. And I think this is part of that wider thing that's been evolving, whether we call it the corporate social responsibility yeah. back in the day or we call it ESG today. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said before, you turn on CNBC and you hear the word ESG all the time. And it's like, mm-hmm. guys, this is, this is, it's becoming something that's not just the, the fringe of any more of people saying, well, this is something that we want to do as part of our corporate, you know, our corporate idea or who we want to be. It's become the mainstream in that everyone, you're under the scrutiny of everybody and anything when things happen. And so to your point, Kelly, I think taking action on this is an ability, whether it's enforced or not, it's an ability for you to audit your own business and be able to know in what's going on, how it's going on, and having the right tools in place and Mm -hmm. procedures in place is going to help you make sure that you're doing this better, particularly if we're going to see other types of laws uh, happen. And in fact, in, in the in that supply chain laws guide, we just we put a litany of all the ones that are out there. And those are just the ones that we've seen more important. I mean, there's even like you go to places like Norway, there's a Norway law that's going on. I mean, any place you're going to do business, this is yeah. this is going to be front and center. And you got to understand the nuances. And we're going to talk about uh, that resource that, that uh, Dino just mentioned uh, in just a minute. Uh, but Kelly, maybe before we start talking action, I know we were chatting about the due diligence clause yes. in the act. What what? So this is the, the steps that are required to prove that you're abiding by it. And so, Constantine, I guess what I would ask you, clearly supply chain risk is not work that's ever done. You know, to what extent would most mature pre-existing supply chain risk management programs catch something like this? And to what extent and maybe how frequently do companies need to be revisiting where they're looking, what data sources they're pulling in, how they're approaching decision making? Is this something that would naturally fold in if you had a mature program? Or is this something where you need to very deliberately say, we need additional provisions and effort and attention paid to remain compliant with this new law? Yeah, I think you have to take a look at how you've looked in the past at managing these laws and how you've tried to address them and then understand what additional information you think you might need. Now, something like this, because it's kind of under the covers a little bit, it's not going to be something front and center that even maybe a supplier or sub tier might be admitting. Right. So you're going to almost have to be more investigatory and being able to have these additional resources to be able to monitor that or know what's going on. And so I think it, it definitely is a maturity question of how you've managed these be- things before. But I think for the most part, every company or a lot of companies we've talked to are always looking to do it better. I don't mm-hmm. think anybody's perfectly solved it because it re- sometimes requires a number of different solutions, if you want to call it, to be able to manage. In some cases, it's your contracts. In some mm-hmm. cases, it's your procure- procurement. In other cases, it's what's your representation that you have in places like D.C., in terms of, 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 of these discussions in industry groups where you're trying to play or play a pivotal role in discussing how the industry manages this. Uh, as we had talked about earlier, Kelly, I mean, uh, earlier this year, we had a, um, a company that came to a pro- our, our, us and said, hey, we're a very large semiconductor manufacturer. This has become very important to us. And we know another competitor tried doing this and they got in trouble or they had a challenge because their suppliers pushed back in China and said, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had to apologize for whatever we wanted to do. So there's these, again, it's, it's very challenging and it's not mm-hmm. an easy answer, but it comes down to how you're trying to manage that, what you've done in the past and 
how how you think that a, a, a solution could help you improve on that. But um, there's there, I don't think there's one way to solve this this problem. Agreed. Uh, so much great perspective in this conversation. Uh, Dean, I wish we had another more time. And I want to point out two additional comments. I'm, and I'm sorry we couldn't get everybody's comments here today as we kind of come down the home stretch. But Jamie, excellent question. Could this type of need for transparency be the push for blockchain that the pandemic was for video conferencing? What a great question there. Um, and Eric, you know, Eric, Eric has been very active part of the conversation today. He's excited this conversation mm -hmm. is happening, he says. Having served in the U.S. Navy for 20 years. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I've seen forced labor in multiple countries. Seeing that has impacted me personally, I bet. Uh, so Eric will have to uh, say, we'll have to bring you back for a uh, deeper uh, conversation. Really appreciate your, your passion here today. Um, okay. So as smart people always do, they kind of bowl down the path forward into simple steps, right? Simple steps. Let's, let's take bites of the elephant. And, and Dina, my guess is you've got a couple of suggested first step or two as folks want to take action uh, about these challenges that we've been we've been chatting through today, right? So what's what would you say a reasonable first step for companies to take if they're not sure this regulation affects them or their suppliers? Yeah, I, I think the first thing they need to do is get a good assessment of what they think or what they have acknowledged uh, uh, is happening in China, like what percentage of their supply base, how much work is being done there. And then being able just to assess how they're currently monitoring for any information that they're getting on those suppliers today, because that could become a challenge because of the filtering. I mean, even even trying to use technologies like Google, uh, uh, Google Maps, for instance, in China, yes. they don't work. Right. So getting an assessment of knowing how transparent is that supply chain today, specifically for this law. And then being able to assess, okay, well, how do we want to then, what next steps do we want to take? What type of monitoring do we want to do on our suppliers? What kind of assessments do we want to put together to get that information firsthand from our suppliers? And then be able to bring that information together to say, okay, what percentage of, of our supply chains are going to be impacted by this, whether it's based on category or whether it's based on a business unit product that we have that goes into the manufacturing. I think those are some of the, the key ways, but it, it all goes down to the collaboration of how you're currently managing uh, other aspects of, of similar laws, um, but knowing particularly because of China being a very high impact for many companies doing business there, that would be an approach to take. Um, and then understanding uh, what kind of technologies you have already or how you wanna implement those and, and, and uh, bring those into the fold of what you already may have within a supplier management system or supplier information management. Uh, uh, tool like uh, like across the source to pay or supply chain tool. Um, yeah. Those are those are things I would start taking a look at to see how easy is it to bring that information in to make sure you have this holistic view and where this might be one piece out of many that you're tracking uh, for mm -hmm. a particular supplier. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, that is uh, actionable advice that folks can take whether they ever have a conversation with you or not, and that's that's uh, that's very valuable. But there's also, we've got a great um, resource that you referenced earlier that we'll make sure folks mm -hmm. are aware of. It is Supply Chain Laws uh, You Should Know, and it's uh, a downloadable uh, resource from our friends at Risk Methods, and we're going to drop the link in the chat so folks can check that out. Um, briefly describe this and any other resources you might point people in the direction of. Yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of a byproduct of the demand of what came out of a lot of the asks that are uh, our, our, our customers have had or just the conversations that we've had. And, you know, governments and regulators in many countries are, again, stepping up the scrutiny of these supply chain laws. And so what we decided to do is put together a kind of a collection, if you will, of the, the best of going back to 2014 of all these different types of laws, what they are and, and how you should look at them. And we're not we're not subscribing to say that we're a compliance company. We're not a legal entity. We don't we don't promote the certification of the laws. But what we do do is help increase the awareness, awareness of how you should be tracking this and understand the management of these as part of your wider supply chain risk process or even ESG or, or compliance. And so we put these together to provide brief descriptions so that 
our, our prospects and, and customers can get more familiar with these terms, particularly if they're going to be going out to new regions and understanding what the legal aspects are. And so, again, we've looked at laws that are anything from the California Transparency Supply Chain Act, if you believe it, that happened in 2014, all the way up to this new act that, you know, with the Uber and, and the Norwegian Transparency Act that we talked about before, and everything in between, primarily in the UK, the EU, and the US. So those are the regions that we looked at the most that would be impacting our, our audience. And uh, it's a good uh, it's a good 11 page read, uh, not necessarily the lightest reading, but it's good as a reference, I will say, uh, unless you really like this kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's a good reference to, to get back to. So it's not for the faint of heart to what you're saying, but you know what, <laughs> you know what? Global supply chain is not for the faint of heart, right? Yeah. I mean, yes, you got sure. to lean into these things. And, and uh, this is, this is a extremely challenging one of many uh, aspects of doing business in 2022, but the good news, and there's always good news. If you go looking for it, the good news is uh, supply chain leaders and practitioners and organizations there is demand to tackle this and and to not allow industry, there's a growing demand to not allow industry to, to unfortunately help fuel it, but to help combat it. And, you know, Kelly, that's a big part of our partnership with Hope for Justice. And I love the role, one, one of many, that Constantine and his team have yeah. in arming folks with the information and data they need to make better decisions that help fuel this this renaissance that's taking place that hopefully is going to change global industry for the better. So, uh, but Kelly, before we say adieu, we got to make sure folks know how to connect with Constantine. Absolutely. But what's your um, give you kind of the final final pre word for before your final word? So your thoughts. So actually, Scott, I keep thinking about Marina Trepova. We spoke to her. She's a procurement professional from Ukraine, Constantine. She just recently got herself out of Kiev. And right near the end of our conversation, she said something about sometimes procurement people feel small and they think that they're small and therefore there's not much they can do. And if there's anything that I heard over and over again in this last hour, it's that we may be small, but we are mighty and there's a lot that we need to do. So the opportunity is massive. Oh, uh, well said. And as we also mentioned in, in that brilliant conversation with the one with a um, intrepid, brilliant, extraordinary, brave individual that Marina Tripova is, um, you know, small nudges is how we work collectively together to move mountains. And, um, you know, but you, but, but you got to have the data, you got to have the information, right? You got to have the purpose, uh, leadership, uh, deliberate purpose. So um, Constantine, uh, man, you're better than advertised. Uh, there's a reason the demand in the market is there, really. Um, I, you know, these are complicated issues, and I appreciate you and Kelly, how y'all been able to take the last hour where, and, and talk about them in a way that anyone, almost regardless of their experience, can start to better comprehend and be poised to take action because that's what it's all about. Um, how can folks connect with you and the Risk Methods team? Uh, many different ways. I, I think the easiest way is just to go to riskmethods.net, take a look at the information that we have. We're doing tons of stuff with regard to the Ukraine crisis and the war there. We have other information about our products. So just visit us there and see where that guides you. A lot of the different resources that we just brought up can give you just information. If you're just looking to learn more about this industry and understand what risk monitoring is, for instance, uh, that would be the best way to do that. So I, I appreciate it. And then if you guys want to reach out to us directly, that would be fantastic. But yeah, those are great places to go. Awesome. Constantine Dino Limbarakis. Uh, I really enjoyed all your perspective today, folks. We've got the link. Uh, we'd encourage you to connect with him, but we've got the link to that resource, Supply Chain Laws, you should know in the comments. Easy to download. Uh, Constantine, thank you so much. And we hope to have you back here on Dial P for Procurement, on Supply Chain Now, again, very, very soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks, right. Constantine. See you soon. All right. Uh, what? Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Uh, love Constantine's passion, his intellect, been there, done that. Uh, his ability to have a conversation, you know, an agnostic conversation about industry, willing to help beyond what Risk Methods does. Yeah. Of course, Risk Methods quite a powerful organization in uh, its own right. But Kelly, uh, you're our procurement guru here. What's been some of your key takeaways from what Dino said here? 
I mean, whenever you see something that you do for a living show up in the news, it's a good idea to take notice. But for me personally, I guess I welcome the tough conversations. This is not an easy thing to talk about. We mentioned it's not an easy thing to talk about with suppliers. Um, and yet every time something is hard to discuss, it means that there's really an opportunity to do something important. And as we see with the way this law is structured, not taking these steps and not having these conversations actually makes you and your organization culpable. So I love that we get to have this kind of conversation on Dial P and we have these tough conversations on supply chain now. I think it's important um, because as many of the, the folks in the audience mentioned today, this is something that needs to be talked about, but you're not necessarily hearing from it everywhere. So I'm glad to be one place people can go for, for straight information on a hard topic. And I think Constantine's an excellent person to, to help us get the basics, figure out how to take action, right? Better understand the, the overall situation. I learned a ton this hour. So this was great. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, as Clay, as Clay shared, great show. Love the insights. Eye opening. Uh, I agree in a very real manner there. And then, and then uh, Peter says, Clay, don't be such a suck up. <laughs> so I love that uh, Peter and Clay. I love y'all both. Um, but you know, uh, as we start to wrap, uh, and we'll wrap here in a minute, folks, mm -hmm. make sure you connect with Constantine and, and Risk Methods. Download the resources. Hey, they're free, and yeah. you'll be more informed and, and uh, more empowered to take action. And as someone brilliant in the comments said at some point, uh, informed professionals make informed decisions. Such yes. a, It's so simple, but it's so true. But, you know, we were talking about how difficult this conversation is to have as we wrap here, Kelly. And uh, it is. It is, right? Especially live in front of all of our uh, all of our friends across social media, but um, imagine how difficult it is to flee your country and with your family and work in a whole new city, a whole new country, a whole new people, a whole new community, and be able to compartmentalize that and still do your job and do your work and make an impact. Um, that is the, if not sure what the definition of bravery is, but that's gotta be right there amongst them. So y'all, uh, I think the team dropped in, the episode where Kelly and I uh, sit down yes, with please Marina. Watch that. Yeah, it, it will, it, it is eye opening as well. Uh, so y'all check that out. Kelly, a pleasure to have this conversation with you. We love Dino around here. Love his perspective. And Hey, little, little, little side note. Uh, if you want to have a real fun conversation with Dino, talk wine with him. <laughs> we remember that conversation last yes. time we talked about the wine supply chain. It was so fun, but uh, Kelly, always a pleasure. How can folks connect with you? LinkedIn is the best way. And of course, if you enjoyed this, subscribe to Dial P. There's a new episode every single Thursday. Awesome. Uh, folks, make sure you connect with Dino and the Risk Methods team. But whatever you do, whatever you do, there's so many different things you can do here. You got to take action. You got to be like Kelly and Dino and certainly Marina Trepova. You got to do good. You got to give forward and you got to be the change that's needed. Deeds, not words. With that, we'll see you next time right back here on Dial P on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.